have 305 days until the election, and the good news is if the Supreme Court rules Trump is immune from prosecution for anything he did while president, or if the Supreme Court rules the 14th Amendment does not disqualify him from the ballot, or if the Supreme Court rules both, Joe Biden can then declare himself president for life. He can then arrest the Supreme Court. He can then detain Trump without charges or trial. And the Supreme Court has just ruled there's not a goddamned thing anybody can do about it, including them. Well, thank God that's settled. Happy New Year. Just to be clear, I am not advocating for all of that. Although the Supreme Court is rapidly moving towards that point at which the so-called father of the Constitution, James Madison, would remind us it was not supposed to have the final authority on state matters like, you know, election laws. And of course, Trump again perpetrated an act of stochastic terrorism, this time against Maine Secretary of State Shenna Bellows. And bluntly, there is no longer any good reason not to treat him the way we have treated terrorists or suspected terrorists in this country since 9-11. But I am mystified by Angus King, who was a legislative assistant to a Democratic senator from Maine and who himself is now a Democratic senator from Maine, who has granted himself the privilege of calling himself an independent and thus not having to carry any of the responsibilities of being a member of the party, like compromising when you have to or not compromising when you shouldn't, and who has also granted himself the privilege of accepting campaign funds raised by Democrats from Democrats anyway. Under the established constitutional process, the Senate was called upon to determine this precise question in Trump's impeachment trial in January 2021, writes Senator King from up there atop his high horse. While I voted with a bipartisan majority to convict, the required two-thirds of the Senate did not do so. Absent a final judicial determination of a violation of the 14th Amendment's disqualification clause, I believe the decision as to whether or not Trump should again be considered for the presidency should rest with the people as expressed in free and fair elections. This is the ultimate check within our constitutional system, unquote. And so... Angus King preserves for himself some Republican votes while wrapping himself in the Constitution, which Trump will very happily light ablaze while King is still wearing it. Genius, Senator King. Absolute genius. Also, historically and constitutionally inaccurate to the point of imbecility, and I might add to the point of you're a goddamned liar. The Constitution does not require a judicial determination or a congressional or Senate determination that a former office holder has engaged in insurrection. This is not a matter of interpretation for the courts or for you, independent Senator King. It's what the 14th Amendment says as opposed to what a fragment of your voters want you to tell them it says. What it says is your Senate and the House have a right to remove the disqualification of Trump by a two-thirds vote. The disqualification exists. It exists right now. He is disqualified. If you want to vote, it is to undisqualify him. It only stops being a disqualification if you override it by 75 to 25. Thank you. That's what it says. That is the ultimate check within our constitutional system. We call it the Constitution. Alexander Stevens The vice president of the Confederacy, a traitor, was not kept out of the Senate seat to which he was elected because there was some kind of Senate vote. He was kept out because he was involved in an insurrection and everybody knew it, including the people who did the insurrection. And they all said, hey, we better get this down on paper because someday it's not going to be so obvious that Stevens was nearly as guilty of this as was President Jefferson Davis. So let's put a 14th Amendment in the Constitution to clarify it. 
I mean, maybe someday they'll make a movie about making the 14th Amendment, although I'll bet they actually make one about the 13th Amendment because it has more Abraham Lincoln in it. Whatever movies will be. Alexander Stevens and Jefferson Davis never fired a shot at a northern soldier, and Robert E. Lee never led the insurrection, and none of the others were ever convicted in a courtroom or by the Senate or the House, except the Lincoln assassination conspirators, and as we know, half of them were hanged. And one of the prosecutors who helped hang them helped write the 14th Amendment. Stevens never took his Senate seat because he was an insurrectionist, Senator King, in exactly the same way Trump is. Only Trump is more of an insurrectionist because he was on the inside trying to prevent the seating of the authorized elected government of the United States elected to replace his ass. The Confederacy and the war ended, and they took Alexander Stevens and the other Confederate traitor leaders and locked them up in Fort Warren in Boston Harbor, and they let them sit there for several months until President Andrew Johnson pardoned Stevens, and then Stevens took his seat in the House of Representatives. Under the established constitutional process, this is the ultimate check within our constitutional system. My God, King, Trump would wring your neck with a copy of the Constitution. But sure, go ahead. Just so long as your conscience is clear that you thought the Constitution is not enough and you have decided on your own that we needed higher barriers before we as a nation could defend ourselves against a psychotic dictator-in-waiting who wants to turn the government into a personal revenge factory. And oh, by the way, the only thing he's ever going to remember about you, Angus King, is that you voted to impeach him. I hope you can hear me up there, Senator, floating on that cloud above it all. Another quote, I voted to impeach Donald Trump for his role in the January 6th insurrection. I do not believe he should be reelected as president of the United States. However, however, Angus King is shouting down towards us again. Oh, no, no. It's Congressman Jared Golden, quote, Democrat, unquote, from the main second. However, we are a nation of laws. Therefore, until he is actually found guilty of the crime of insurrection, he should be allowed on the ballot. Read that on a fortune cookie, did you, Congressman Golden? Because it's not in the Constitution. I am making two financial offers. I will contribute to anybody who starts a GoFundMe to buy Congressman Golden a copy of the Constitution, which somebody has written, we are a nation of laws, dummy. Here are the laws. The one in Section 3 of the 14th Amendment doesn't say an effing thing about found guilty of the crime. It says engaged in, you grandstanding, weaselly jackass. My second contribution is to whoever primaries Jared Golden for the second in Maine. The congressman and Senator King cannot comprehend or have chosen not to comprehend in order to preserve their stoic New England Calvinist, we are better than partisan politics, clown makeup that will earn them a couple of dozen Republican votes each. They have chosen not to comprehend reality. And the reality is that their statements have reverberated inside the Trump and MAGA and fascist and Republican echo chambers as, quote, proof, unquote, that the efforts to do what the Constitution says must be done, not may, not optional, not if you feel like it, must Golden and King's statements are being used to prove to the Trump cult that all efforts to enforce the freaking Constitution are actually just political partisanship and fear of Trump and cheating and election interference by the Democrats. And Angus King and Jared Golden can go to hell. They are the 2024 equivalents of Tokyo Rose. They are modern-day Alexander Stevens's. 
They are not just betraying a party. They are betraying the Constitution. They are lying about the Constitution because they think it'll help them at the next election. If there is one. If we lose this democracy 305 days from now, it will be Trump's fault. But guess what? Angus King and Jared Golden will have helped. And, to quote the Robert Duvall line from the movie Network, so will the holy goddamned New York Times. It's as if every time anyone, a politician, commentator, an actual journalism professor, an ethicist, every time anyone points out that the Times has lost any connection to reality, any understanding that the things they are reporting on actually matter, actually have consequences, actually will affect them to actually may affect them first, that these are not academic exercises in who can write and edit the best written stories. Every time that happens, somebody at the time says, oh, they're complaining about our whataboutism again. Let's make sure, Harvey, we do an even worse whataboutism tomorrow. Quoting the New York Times, the holy goddamn New York Times, quote, J. Michael Luttig, a retired conservative federal appeals court judge, hailed Colorado's and Maine's decisions as unassailable interpretations of the Constitution. Officials in Maine and Colorado who disqualified Mr. Trump from the ballot have written that their decisions stemmed from following the language of the Constitution. But on a recent sunny Friday afternoon in the Echo Park neighborhood of Los Angeles, Dina Drewis, 37, a copywriter, and Aaron Bagley, 43, a contractor, both of whom have consistently voted for Democrats, expressed a queasy ambivalence over such an extraordinary step. I'm really just conflicted, Mr. Bagley said. It's hard to imagine he didn't fully engage in insurrection. Everything points to it. But the other half of the country is in a position where they feel like it should be up to the electorate, unquote. Well, thanks, holy goddamn New York Times. Thanks for making sure you have a conservative constitutional scholar who has defined what is left of nonpartisanship in our coughing up blood nation. You have included Judge Luttig in your article and... You have the constitutional insights as well of Dina Drewis, who literally wrote copy for Dunkin' Donuts commercials. And Aaron Bagley, who, oh, by the way, you left out, was interviewed by Fox News Los Angeles a month ago after a break in at his place. And therefore, he said he was angry at Joe Biden. What are you doing, holy goddamn New York Times? Judge Luttig. But on the other hand, Dina, who writes Dunkin' Donuts commercials, and Aaron, who's mad at Joe Biden. Close your newspaper. Close the holy goddamn New York Times. Get everybody out and then implode the building. You have sat too long here for any good you have been doing. Depart, I say, and let us have done with you in the name of God. Go. Oh, and that goes for the holy goddamn Washington Post, too. You know who they offered one of those 250 buyouts to because Jeff Bezos, like all billionaires had one good business decision years ago that made him so wealthy that he could never live long enough to make enough bad business decisions to put a real dent in his billions? You know who they offer to buy out to? Greg Sargent. The Post has bought out Greg Sargent, who has not only been on the efforts to prevent dictatorship beat but has pretty much had it to himself for 13 years while the Post's Kathleen Parker assured us Trump wouldn't do anything he said he would do. And the Post's immortal Bob Woodward sat on the Trump COVID tapes for a year. And the Post Josh Dawsey goes to dinner with Jason Miller the night before the first Republican debate. They're all still there. Greg Sargent him the post 
Spies out. Quote, For the first time in our nation's history, a grand jury has charged a former president with committing crimes while in office to overturn an election that he lost. In response, the defendant claims that to protect the institution of the presidency, he must be cloaked with absolute immunity from criminal prosecution unless the House impeached and the Senate convicted him for the same conduct. He is wrong. Separation of powers principles, constitutional text, history, and precedent all make clear that a former president may be prosecuted for criminal acts he committed while in office, including most critically here, illegal acts to remain in power despite losing an election. The presidency plays a vital role in our constitutional system, but so does the principle of accountability for criminal acts, particularly those that strike at the heart of the democratic process. Rather than vindicating our constitutional framework, the defendant's sweeping immunity claim threatens to license presidents to commit crimes to remain in office. The founders did not intend and would never have countenanced such a result. Unquote. From Jack Smith's answer to the Trump presidential immunity bullshit filing for the hearing before the D.C. appeals court a week from today, in which Jack Smith and his team state that the immunity claim and Trump himself Threaten democracy. Fact check. True. And now to answer Mr. Smith is Dina Drewis, who may have written Ben Affleck's commercial for Dunkin' Freakin' Donuts. We don't have a political reporter or columnist in this country who writes as well as the members of Jack Smith's team do, let alone as honestly as they do. I will note here, though, that there is some reporting that did not get widespread play that suggests that the special counsel has more up his sleeve than we know. Robert Costa sometimes gets it right, sometimes not so much, went on his network CBS and said that based on their reporting, Smith, quote, has phone records. He has memos and diary entries from key witnesses like former Vice President Mike Pence, key eyewitness testimony from people who are inside the Oval Office from Trump. But Costa added that Smith has a magic wand, quote, which is subpoena power to really go deep with witnesses. They've gone deep. And I've talked to people who participated in this investigation as lawyers, sometimes even as witnesses, and it's evident to me, based on my conversations with sources, that Jack Smith has a sprawling case against Trump, unquote. Sprawling case. To answer that reporting, here is a man once insulted by President Biden, a Mr. Donald T. Rump of Florida, Just remember, Dementia J. Trump has now accused Liz Cheney of deleting January 6th evidence that never existed. He is now online boasting that even the Russians, quote, know, unquote, that the 2020 election was stolen. And how would they know that, Donnie? And he has moved from confirming in 1990 that the movie mogul Martin Davis gave him a book of Trump's speeches to denying that when he talked about migrants poisoning the nation's blood, just like Hitler did, denying that he had ever read Mein Kampf, to moving on to insisting, quote, I know nothing about Hitler. I'm not a student of Hitler. I never read his works. They said that he said something about blood. Ah, but thank God Dementia J. Trump can never stop at the point where he really, really might get away with it. Quote, and he didn't say it the way I said it either. It's a very different kind of statement. So he knows nothing about Hitler except that he said the same thing, but Hitler said it differently. And of course, here, here Trump is right. Hitler did say it differently. He said it in German. One other note about this. If you have asked how... The MAGAs sleep at night. Day after day of the stuff we talk about here and much more beyond that, the answer is right in front of us. The answer is they do not know 
either how wrong nor how hated they are. And you can judge this by those rare occasions when their cocoons are pierced. And we just had one of those, and we should not let it pass without recognizing its implications. It was during, of all things, Dick Clark's New Year's Rockin' Eve Sunday night on ABC. Billy Joe Armstrong of Green Day changed the lyrics of American Idiot from I'm not part of a redneck agenda to I'm not part of the MAGA agenda, changed them again, and to hundreds of thousands, perhaps, of Trump cultists, this is the first time they have realized that they are not well-liked or that the song American Idiot is about them and about Trump. They don't get news. They don't talk to people who, who get news. They are in a sealed-off cult as tightly form-fitting as the government of North Korea. They don't even know that Green Day has been slamming them for years. The band has swapped in this very mild political commentary for at least four years, ever since they did it first at the iHeart Music Festival in Vegas in September 2019. A proud moment for us here, I'll say. But honestly, the reaction to New Year's Eve underscores this reality. They don't know. They never have to encounter reality. They think they represent 95% of the country. The reason they keep going back to this fantasy that Joe Biden could not have gotten 81 million votes is they are protected from knowing those people or how many of them there are. They are protected from hearing anything positive about Biden. They are protected from hearing any evidence that Trump is the villain that he is. The terrifying reality is, never mind convincing the Trumpists, you can't even reach these American I Id idiots. American idiots. Oh, 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 Nancy! <laughs> Reach the American idiots. I'm not a part of the MAGA agenda. Eight years of hearing only Trump propaganda. And what do you mean Dick Clark is dead? Thank you, Nancy Faust. You know where this all ends, right? This ends with a podcast where there are no more commentaries. There's just me doing 19 second long political parodies of songs until Tom Lehrer, who is now 95 years old, comes over and beats me senseless with the rolled up sheet music from the Werner von Braun song. Also of interest here in this all-new edition of Countdown, a Pennsylvania woman charged with liquoring up a couple dozen underage high schoolers at her own daughter's 17th birthday party and punching one of the drunken boys in the face. Is she A, a drag queen, B, a transgendered school swimmer, C, a librarian, or D, the founder of the Keeping Kids in School PAC and former Republican candidate for lieutenant governor. The correct answer is next. This is Countdown. This is Countdown with Keith Elberman. Postscripts to the news. Some headlines, some updates, some snarks, some predictions. 
Dateline, Doylestown, Pennsylvania. Here we go again. Another self-proclaimed defender of the kids and parental rights advocate has been arrested, not just for hosting an underage drinking party at her home for her 17-year-old daughter, but livening things up a little bit by socking a 16-year-old boy in the eye. Clarice Schillinger of the PAC Keeping Kids in School and former Republican candidate for lieutenant governor of Pennsylvania claims the charges have been dropped. The Bucks County District Attorney says, oh, no, they haven't. There's also cell phone video of this and reports that this was not the first underage drinking party over at Clarice's place and that her ex-boyfriend also hit one of the kids and her mother hit one of the kids, too, allegedly, of course. Not a drag queen, not a transgendered person, Clarice, parental rights advocate, allegedly. I'll explain this briefly as it was explained to me by a psychological pro. Some people who are doing things they believe are wrong or are doing things that just are wrong and can't stop themselves, you know, getting teenagers liquored up or they might think being gay or wearing dresses or whatever, instead of coming to terms with their own individuality or in the cases of the actual illegal stuff and the immoral stuff like getting teenagers liquored up, Instead of trying actually to overcome inappropriate behavior, like getting teenagers liquored up and then punching them in the face, they decide to view the whole thing as if it was some kind of scoreboard. Let's use this as a nice neutral example. Let's say this woman and her boyfriend were both named Keith, and they were convinced that being named Keith was evil and wrong, and a sin, and against the Bible, and a moral failing. Yet, there they are, both named Keith. And that puts, in their minds, say, uh, 40 points on this scoreboard against them for being Keiths. On the anti-Keith scoreboard, they're down by 40 points. So how do they live with this? How do they rationalize it? They try to make naming any other kid Keith illegal. They prosecute all the Keiths they can find. They blame Keiths for moral decline. They try to get Trump to deport Keiths. In their minds, well, yes, there are 40 points against them for being Keiths, but doing all that, being virulently, mindlessly anti-Keith, that puts a thousand points on their scoreboard in their favor. So 1,000 to 40, well, they can't really have endangered kids by being named Keith. That was only 40 points on their scoreboard. Their anti-Keith behavior, that's a 1,000 points worth. See, it's all better now. They can't be Keiths. They're a net 960 anti-Keith. You see? Well, you probably don't see because you're probably relatively normal. They do. It is the complicated rationalization that keeps them from going insane. Well, completely insane. Dateline Houston, some fascists are born dumb, some achieve dumbness, and some have dumbness thrust upon them. And then there's conservative yacker Jesse Kelly, who is so dumb that all three of those options must be true. People love to sound sophisticated and brag about European art and architecture, Kelly writes on social media. I've seen America's, and I've seen what they've got. Theirs can't touch ours. And below this, Mr. Kelly put a photo of the Statue of Liberty, which was designed by a French German from Alsace, and constructed by the French, including Gustave Eiffel, and given to us as a gift by France. But remember, as Homer Simpson says, our Beatles are better than England's Rolling Stones. And Dateline Washington, I am very sorry to report to you the death last week of Tom Foti who was already a mainstay of UPI Audio the day I broke into broadcasting on that network in 1979. He was austerely supportive of my work then, and he was a mainstay of CBS Radio News until literally two weeks ago, and still austerely supportive of my work on this podcast, on a daily basis almost. 
Tom Foti was born in two news, trapped literally in the Hungarian uprising of 1956. A 10-year-old boy stuck in a shelter with his family finally got out to discover Soviet tanks had destroyed his home. They escaped to Austria and then, just at this time of the year, to New Jersey. He got into radio at City College of New York and then went to Washington for UPI, eventually running the bureau there, then moving to NBC Radio and WTOP Radio in D.C. and ultimately to the CBS Radio Network a quarter of a century ago. Tom worked whenever they asked him to. He covered everything. He did the big stories and the small ones, and you could basically never surprise him. Assign him to Bush v. Gore, and he knew the constitutional and electoral precedents. Ask him to anchor a six-hour shift until 10 p.m. one night, and then come back for another one starting at 3 a.m., and he was there. Just enough time for a nap. And his work was seamless and flawless, and all of us who knew him forever, we all thought his work was eternal. We still don't know what happened when Tom Foti died a week ago. The plain truth is, if I were to have said that, we don't know what happened about somebody else in broadcasting. I would be expecting an email to pop into my inbox by midday with the full story and the full background from Tom Foti. He was 77 years old. to come on this all new edition of countdown i don't know why i thought of this but we are now in the 25th anniversary year of the night before game one of the world series and the atlanta hotel we were staying in put me in a room next to a team of singers competing in a choir competition whose coach had decided to have them practice in that room all night How the hotel tried to make it up to me is worth listening to. It involves a baby grand piano and things I promised not to tell. First time for the daily roundup of the miscreants, morons, and Dunning-Kruger effect specimens who constitute today's worst persons in the world. The bronze, worse, Fox. Fox did a year-end, those we lost in 2023 bit on its quote, news unquote feed. Included among those memorialized by Fox, Baseball Hall of Famer Frank Thomas, the big hurt of the Chicago White Sox. Video of him hitting one of his 521 career homers, his years, born 1968, died 2023. The solemn tone of the newsreader who had no idea who he was or who she was or where she was as she read this. There was one small detail. That baseball player named Frank Thomas, Frank Edward Thomas, did not die last year. Frank Joseph Thomas, three-time All-Star, member of the original 1962 New York Mets, he did die at the age of 93. Different person. There can be two people named Frank Thomas, both of whom played baseball. News to Fox. Frank Thomas, still living and himself a former analyst on Fox's baseball coverage, said he was really upset by Fox's slovenliness and attempt to, you know, bury him. On the other hand, Frank could look at it this way. Between his time on its baseball show and his premature memorial, he has now twice cheated death at the hands of Fox. Runner-up worser Aaron Rodgers, who used to be a football quarterback, injured in the first 10 seconds of his career with the New York Jets, The famous liar and hallucinogenic tea user who deceived the league and the fans about whether or not he was vaccinated during COVID. He went on ESPN to complain about those who criticized the New York Jets decision to put him on the active roster in the waning weeks of the regular season, even though he still can't play. That cost another player his job and his salary. Rodgers did not name any this time. Previously, he included me, but he said, quote, before they talk, let's go back to 2021. Let's make people say their vax status to start. That'll frame all these comments in the right window. Before they say something, let's have them say, hey, I'm so-and-so double vaxxed with Pfizer and triple boosted. And my opinion is 
Well, so far, Aaron Rodgers was merely being his usual paranoid, self-absorbed, afraid of needles, self-destructive, moronic self. Then it went bad for him. Quote, at least then you'd know and everybody would know at that point they have their puppet masters who are puppeteering them to say this certain thing. Unquote. Puppet masters, as in the anti-Semitic trope of the same name. Flatly, were Aaron Rodgers right, and of course he's not, he would be banned from football for life by, you know, the puppet masters. But since he's wrong and nuts and using an anti-Semitic trope, he should be banned from football for life because he thinks there are puppet masters. But the winner, the worst, Michael Flynn Jr., the son of the disgraced, crazed, disloyal, and tiny ex-general. By the way, before we drop Aaron Rodgers completely, do you remember he used to be a TV pitchman, a spokesman for an insurance company? He could not get an ad selling, I don't know, hydroxychloroquine tablets right now. The winner, Michael Flynn Jr. Flynn the Elder was slammed by a woman on Twitter X who referred to him as Mike Flynn, and Flynn the Younger responded in a tweet that he closed replies, except for his friends, because Flynn Jr. is also a coward. Flynn Jr. wrote, quote, It's General Flynn, bitch, get it right, unquote. Leading to the hashtag, and I'm proud to say I helped with this, the hashtag, quote, General Flynn, bitch. Nice work, Sonny. Dad's very proud of you. Michael, thanks to me, they call my dad General Flynn Bitch Flynn Jr. Today's worst person in the world, Flynn Bitch. To the number one story on the countdown and my favorite topic, me and things I promise not to tell. And I do not exactly remember what caused me to think of this story, except for the fact that it has lurked always just beneath the front of my mind since it first happened in October 1999. I was finishing my first year as the principal anchor and senior correspondent for Fox Sports News. Fox's first attempt to challenge ESPN I was the host of the Game of the Week on the Fox Broadcast Network, baseball, and things had gone pretty well. The guy who hired me recognized it would be five years before we had enough credibility to maybe say we were getting 40% of ESPN's audience. He had quit and moved back to England, and he had been replaced by another guy who said he would raise the ratings in five weeks or everybody would get fired. My direct boss had hired a clown named Chris Myers to be the top anchor for Fox Sports News and spent something like $250,000 to lure him away from ESPN, not knowing that ESPN was actually trying to get Myers to leave without having to fire him. None of my direct boss's bosses had told my direct boss that they were hiring me for $3 million to be the top anchor for Fox Sports News. Myers was bitterly resentful about this, I mean more so than usual, and his boss, who had chained himself to Myers, was even more bitterly resentful. Myers began to demand anything they gave me. They built me a small wardrobe cabinet, so when I moved to L.A., I could keep some clothes and some valuables in my office until I got my own home. Well, the next thing I knew, they had built one for Myers. I poked my head in his office one day when he was not there. It was an exact duplicate of mine. The only thing he had in his wardrobe cabinet was one lone bent hanger. Myers co-anchored with Steve Lyons, who was proudly doing homophobic jokes on our air. Lyons worked the baseball show with me every Saturday on Big Fox, and I always thought I was the biggest complainer in the world until I met Lyons, and like the second morning, he left the makeup room, and the hairstylist said she was preparing to kill him, but before she did and the police came, she wanted to thank me for never complaining. Despite all this, we were somehow getting enormous amounts of publicity. Every time anybody wrote an article about ESPN or SportsCenter or Dan Patrick, they devoted at least a third, sometimes a half of the article to me 
and Fox Sports News and my former partnership with Dan. And our publicity department did nothing with any of this free publicity. Millions of dollars worth of free publicity. No commercials boasting about all the good press. No advertising about all the good press. Nothing. Plus, just to round it out, I had a stalker who advised me that she was not surprised I had not responded to her in her five years of phone calls and letters. I just needed time. And anyway, she knew I was talking to her during the show in code, and she would be coming out to L.A. to marry me or kill me. She had not decided which. And all I could think was, she's going to kill me, and the makeup artist is going to kill lions, and you know what that means. That means Myers will wind up getting to do the baseball show by himself. So things are going great. 1999 was the last World Series that Fox did not televise, but we sent a full crew anyway to cover it wall to wall for our fledgling cable network and Fox Sports News, and I was the anchor. I don't think they sent Lyons or Myers. And with me, there were two of our cable-only analysts, the former Red Sox and Rangers manager Kevin Kennedy and the former Dodgers second baseman Steve Sachs. I liked them both. We worked well together. They had utterly different styles. After our live shots from the field at Turner Field in Atlanta following Game 1 of that World Series, our producer Eric Weinberger gathered us in the Fox Luxury Suite down the first baseline, and he asked us what our needs were to improve what had been kind of a sloppy Game 1 effort. And I said, well, the the monitor off which I, I have to narrate the highlights, that needs to be adjusted. And mind you, we're going on the air two minutes after the game. I have not seen the highlights nor could I, nor do I know which highlights have been chosen. I am ad-libbing on top of ad-libbing, and the only monitor, which is black and white and about four inches in diameter, this had been placed on the dirt next to the Braves' dugout. I had literally had to drop to my hands and knees the second the highlights started to play to have any chance at all. I said, just put the monitor on a on a stool or a, or a chair or or the wall, or have somebody hold it up near my face. Weinberger said, okay. Kevin Kennedy said that the Fox scopes, the pre-produced in-depth analyses of pitch sequences or defensive positionings, the inside baseball of inside baseball, he kind of needed to see at least some of them before going on the air with them, maybe during the commercial breaks, or he would have no idea what to tell the audience, as was evidenced after game one. Weinberger said, okay, absolutely. And then he said to Sachs, and what do you need, Steve? And Sachs said, utterly sincerely, and with as much concern as I had had for the monitor and Kennedy had had for the Fox scopes, Sachs said, you got any more of these cookies? These are great. (sighs) What I had not told Weinberger was something he already knew. I had to get more sleep. Fox had put us in a hotel in suburban Buckhead, Georgia, the Swiss Hotel, which I guess has been a Westin for 20 years. Nice enough place, big rooms, and the one they put me in the first night was next to a party or a meeting of some kind. I mean, there were, it sounded like, 20 or 30 people in there. Ordinary-sized room, same as mine. I called the desk. Sorry, no other rooms available. They would call my neighbors and make sure they would quiet down before bedtime. And they did. And then at 2 a.m., I discovered what kind of party or meeting it was and why 20 people were in the room, in an ordinary-sized room, in what started as a dream and then turned into literally unbelievable reality. I heard a loud southern voice say, If we are going to win this competition, we're going to have to be the best chorus that ever left North Carolina. And they began to sing. Gospel mostly, which is fine, except not at 2 a.m. Make that now 3 a.m. The night before game one of the World Series, which I have to cover on live TV. Oh, and and they'd get 30 or 40 seconds into one of the hymns, and the director, who had a voice like like the PA system at Turner Field, only way clearer, would stop them and yell at them and make them start from the beginning. They were competing in the morning, and he had decided they were going to spend the night, the whole night, that night, practicing. 
I called the desk and I made a few sharp-edged remarks about being on national television and how many opportunities I would have to bankrupt the Buckhead Swiss Hotel and the Swiss Hotel chain generally, and suddenly they found me another room to move to. And I gathered my stuff and trudged a few floors and scattered my stuff in the new room, and I fell onto the bed and I went right to sleep and I got a solid two or three minutes... And that's when the bathroom phone began to ring. Not the main phone in the room, just the one in the bathroom. And I picked it up, and there was a dial tone, and it kept ringing. A hundred rings, two hundred rings. I disconnected the phone line from the wall. It kept ringing. I thought I have to be on one of two TV shows. Either I'm on Candid Camera or The Twilight Zone. The phone is alive. I've disconnected it from the wall and it's still ringing. It is now 5 a.m. I still have a chance to get a full night's sleep, a full day's sleep before the game, but the rest of the day will be erased. I called the desk. My God, we still have one of those phones in one of the rooms? I thought we'd removed all of them. I'll send the electrician. He got there surprisingly fast. He did not bother with any niceties, and he simply did what I would have done. He yanked the whole thing out of the wall and took it with him. I closed the door behind him, and I could hear it as he moved back down the hall towards the elevator. The phone was still ringing. It was a possessed phone. As the sun began to rise and I crawled back into bed, I remembered something vital. I called my new friend at the front desk again and I pleaded with him. Upon my arrival the night before, which seemed like three or four decades earlier, I had sent over a suit to be pressed. Please, could you make sure they do not deliver it until I call? I have to sleep. Guaranteed, sir, you get some sleep now. The knock came at 8.30 a.m. Valet service! I shout, Go away! A moment later, the phone rings. Valet service! Minutes after that, the phone rings again. Hi, this is the valet manager. We wanted to make sure, did you get your suit? I emitted a string of popular Anglo-Saxon expletives. I had now been violently awakened so many times by so many different means that my vision had blurred. I called the desk, I asked for the fax number of the general manager's office, and in those days before the universality of email, I wrote the general manager a crisp and enraged letter, summarizing to her my night in her hell with elevators, and explaining I would be checking out and going anywhere a cab could take me, a Motel 6, a YMCA, a safe-looking bus stop. When I finally woke to my own alarm around two in the afternoon, I found a note slipped under my door. It was as apologetic as anything I have ever read, and it had this sentence in it. I know we cannot undo the harm we have done to you, but I would offer you this by way of apology at 8 p.m. this evening. The presidential suite will become available. Please try it just tonight with our compliments. We will pack and move your belongings in your absence, and my assistant will stay tonight until you return from the game and will personally escort you to the suite. Okay, well, I had to give that a shot, didn't I? The presidential suite at the Swiss Hotel in Buckhead, Georgia, was not what I expected. The front doors, there were two of them, opened onto a dining table which seated... 28. A few feet away from this 28-seater, well, 20 or 30 or 40 feet, was the baby grand piano. In the next room, to the left, just a few minutes' walk away, was the kitchen and the conference room, which had the big table. Each of the bedrooms had a fireplace, so did the living room. There were four bedrooms, There was a sauna. There was a hot tub. There was a second hot tub out on the balcony. There was a walk-in closet larger than the first room they had given me. There was a door in the back of the walk-in closet that led to a second walk-in closet. 
I thought immediately of two things. I called all the women I had dated in the preceding year to see if any of them wanted to fly to Atlanta at my expense, even if it was just to see the presidential suite. I called women I had known from when I occasionally worked in Atlanta 16 years earlier. I then thought, well, all right, practically here, we can hold the pre-production meeting for Game 2 of the World Series in, well, either in the living room with the 28-seat dining table or in the conference room with the 36-seat table. Hell, we could hold Game 2 of the World Series in this suite. My only concern with that in a suite so big it should have had its own zip code was that there was an excellent chance Steve Sachs would get lost in it and we would never find him. And then I thought, no, they'll probably charge me extra for such a wonderful bonus. The Buckhead Georgia Swiss Hotel and its general manager, whose name is lost in the folds of history, had cemented a place in my travel hall of fame, and we were discussing that during the pre-production with our Fox Sports News crew at noon on Sunday before Game 2, munching on the six plates of free food they had sent up, when the doorbell rang. I say doorbell. It sounded like the bells at Notre Dame in Paris. There, to my surprise, outside the double doors, were three hotel staffers with luggage carts. For a moment, I thought they had come to give us free rides to the lobby. I expressed my surprise at their presence. Well, said the staffer, who turned out to be the other assistant to the hotel's general manager, you're checking out today. I smiled. No, 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 tomorrow. Game two is tonight. We're checking out tomorrow, tomorrow morning. Suddenly, the bell station manager looked sad, even remorseful. Oh, for God's sakes, we got that wrong, too. I'm afraid we need the presidential suite for an actual president tonight. I, I can move you to the governor's suite, he said, hopefully. <clears throat> they packed my stuff as I instructed the Fox staff to eat all of the food on the platters and to stuff anything they could not eat into their pockets. I tried to sneak in a quick sauna, but the staff said there was a certain element of hurry up involved. Finally, we all paraded down the hall to the governor's suite, and Weinberger and I were speculating that this would only have one conference table and only one hot tub, and it would all be indoors, and there would be no balcony, and, and we'd all be like Cinderella when the clock struck midnight, and we get there, and the assistant to the general manager opens the door to the governor's suite with great ceremony, and there, five feet in from the vestibule, perfectly placed on the ratty and bright blue 1981 nylon rug that might once have been the artificial turf at Veterans Stadium in Philadelphia, was the biggest carpet stain I have ever seen in my life. Easily 10 feet in diameter, causable only by the spilling of nuclear waste or by a murder. So, I said to the chagrined assistant to the general manager, who was putting down a fresh towel to cover the stain, and to whom it was apparently news that his governor's suite featured a stain the size of the chalk outline of where the body had fallen. So, I asked him, when does the chorus arrive for practice? I've done all the damage I can do here. Thank you for listening. Two saunas. Countdown musical directors Brian Ray and John Philip Chanel arranged, produced, and performed most of the music. Mr. Chanel handled orchestration and keyboards. Mr. Ray was on guitars, bass, and drums, and it was produced by TKO Brothers. Other music, including some of the Beethoven compositions, arranged and performed by the group No Horns Allowed. The sports music is the Olderman theme from ESPN2, written by Mitch Warren Davis, courtesy of ESPN Inc. Our satirical and pithy musical comments were by Nancy Faust, the best baseball stadium organist ever. Our announcer today was my friend John Dean, and everything else was pretty much my fault. 
That's countdown for this, the 1,092nd day since Dementia J. Trump's first attempted coup against the democratically elected government of the United States. That's right, three years ago Saturday. Use the 14th Amendment, use the Insurrection Act, use the prosecutions to convict him, use everything we got while we still can. The next scheduled countdown is tomorrow. Until then, I'm Keith Olbermann. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, and good luck. Can't even reach the American idiots. I'm not a part of the MAGA agenda. Trump propaganda. And what do you mean that Clark is dead? <laughs> <laughs>